Hi there, this is Trip Buckley. Um, thank you for joining us for this Endoscopy Now uh, live webinar. Um, we appreciate you joining um, and we'll be starting uh, here, well, right now. So um, hopefully uh, we're gonna have a great talk and great discussion afterwards. So let me introduce uh, Vanny Conda to begin with. She is an associate professor uh, at Texas A&M College of Medicine. Uh, she's at the Baylor Scott and White Clinic in Dallas um, and directs the uh, Center for Esophageal Diseases. And uh, we're also joined by Dr. Elisa Ferre, who is also my partner um, at the University of Texas Austin Dell Medical School. And she's an assistant professor of surgery and she heads our uh, heartburn and esophageal disorders clinic. So. Um, Thanks to our uh, our sponsors, um, we uh, couldn't do this certainly without you. That's uh, Castle Biosciences um, and uh, Medtronic. So thank you to them. And without further ado, go ahead, uh, Vanny, take us away. Thank you, Trip. It is such a pleasure to be here with you and Elisa tonight to talk about my favorite topic, novel innovations in Barrett's esophagus and early esophageal cancer. Here are my relevant disclosures. As we are aware, esophageal adenocarcinoma, the predominant form of esophageal cancer in the West, has an incidence, as shown here in the blue curve, and a mortality, as shown here in the red curve, that have been steadily rising over the past several decades. Fortunately, we have a precursor lesion, which is Barrett's esophagus. It is a known risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma, and it is the replacement of esophageal squamous lining with specialized intestinal metaplasia, and it is a complication of chronic reflux. The diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus requires both the endoscopic appearance of salmon-colored mucosa in the tubular esophagus, as well as the histologic component, which is columnar-lined epithelium with the presence of goblet cells or specialized intestinal metaplasia. There is high inter-observer variability among pathologists to diagnose dysplasia, and it is difficult to distinguish dysplasia from inflammation, which is often present in this reflux-rich environment. Expert GI pathologists have less variability, and therefore it is important to confirm dysplasia with an expert GI pathologist. Now, we do not recommend a screening endoscopy for everyone because it is not cost-effective and it likely doesn't benefit everyone in the general population. We do recommend endoscopic screening for those patients with multiple risk factors, and we focus on chronic reflux. We also have a lower threshold for those patients who are men compared to women, and we look at the other multiple risk factors such as age, race, hiatal hernia, family history, central obesity, and smoking. And Non-endoscopic screening is now an option and is likely to be a game changer for screening. And this is important because we have to acknowledge that our screening paradigm is imperfect. Studies suggest that at least 40% of those patients who with esophageal cancer did not complain of heartburn and regurgitation, and that somewhere around 95% of patients with esophageal cancer that underwent surgery did not carry a previous diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, suggesting that our screening criteria, which are heavily focused on reflux and require endoscopy, are not capturing many patients who end up getting esophageal cancer. New cell collection devices provide a way of gathering cells in the esophagus without a sedated endoscopy, which can carry cost, risk, and inconvenience. Cytosponge, for example, has been developed by Rebecca Fitzgerald in England and allows a tethered encapsulated sponge to be swallowed and then the capsule is um, dissolves in the stomach and the sponge is withdrawn back through the esophagus collecting cells, which can then undergo immunocytochemistry staining. And that assay, specifically trefoil factor three, can denote the presence of specialized intestinal metaplasia. And the recent BEST-3 trial, which was a randomized control trial, showed a tenfold increase 
in the detection of Barrett's among those patients who are offered cytosponge compared to the usual care group. A wide, a variety of these non-endoscopic cell collection devices have also been coupled with DNA methylation markers and are demonstrating promising results and with ongoing studies for validation. Patients diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus without dysplasia are recommended to have surveillance endoscopy with a biopsy protocol with intervals of every three to five years. But it's important to recognize that Seattle protocol is a standard protocol to assess for occult neoplasia and requires the biopsy of visible lesions followed by random four quadrant biopsies every one to two centimeters, specifically one centimeter in the history of dysplasia throughout the segment looking for occult neoplasia. Limitations to this protocol, however, include poor adherence, sampling error, and poor adherence is associated with missed neoplasia, which is unfortunately even worse in longer segments. Detection of visible lesions can be subtle and challenging and unfortunately lead to missed cancers in endoscopy with one meta-analysis showing um, a quarter of patients who were diagnosed with an esophageal cancer who had a previous endoscopy had that endoscopy within one year of diagnosis. The critical piece of surveillance is a high quality endoscopic examination. There have been numerous guidelines, recommendations, best practices, and reviews that uh, list out what we should be doing during a high-quality endoscopic examination. To make it easy, I call these the five L's. Essentially, endoscopists should identify esophageal landmarks, measure the length of the Barrett segment, take time to look for subtle lesions, and then identify and target those visible lesions. And then the rest of the segment should be assessed with multiple levels to assess our occult dysplasia. The most investigated and widely used enhanced imaging technique is virtual chromoendoscopy, specifically narrowband imaging, which is a filtered blue light. This can enhance mucosal patterns and vascular patterns. And a simple classification system can denote these patterns as either regular or irregular, with irregular patterns being concerning for neoplasia. Here is an example of a short segment of Barrett's esophagus as seen by white light endoscopy with high resolution endoscope and a soft distal attachment cap fitted to the tip of the endoscope. We can see here that this patient has a neoplastic lesion. They're harboring that lesion if we look at the clock face from 12 o'clock to four o'clock. And sometimes these lesions are subtle and insufflation and deflation can make it easier to appreciate the lesion. Narrow band imaging can also be used to look at the mucosal pattern of this lesion, looking specifically at the distorted pit pattern as well as the irregular vasculature, making it concerning for neoplasia. And looking under narrowband imaging, we can also start to suspect that there's subsquamous extension of this lesion. And again, you can see this area from 12 to four. I also used confocal laser under microscopy to help delineate this lesion in preparation for endoscopic resection. It's important to understand when we see these lesions, what we're dealing with. And really we have to understand the risk of lymph node metastasis. It helps clarify who needs surgery and who can be treated endoscopically. Intramucosal carcinoma or T1A carries a minimal risk of lymph node metastasis, making it amenable for endoscopic resection. Whereas T1B lesions or submucosal cancer carry a much higher risk of submucosal invasive disease and um, of uh, lymph node metastasis, and therefore may require surgery and or systemic therapy. High grade by biopsy alone can be associated with a 40% risk of prevalent cancer. However, most of these lesions are intramucosal, and there's a shared management approach among patients with high grade dysplasia and intramucosal carcinoma. 
the risk for submucosal cancer is in the minority of these cases with high-grade dysplasia, but it is higher in visible lesions, particularly those that are protruding or depressed. And it is important to characterize and document the visible lesions with the Paris classification, which can also help us identify that risk. And it is also the reason why all visible lesions should be resected with endoscopic resection for a definitive diagnosis. And it's because EMR can change the diagnosis up to half the time. While EUS is appropriate for nodal staging, it's inadequate for early T staging. There's also less inter-observer variability among pathologists with EMR. Now, in that case that I showed before, we can see a widely available technique of endoscopic resection, which is the band-assisted endoscopic mucosal resection technique. This lesion was marked, and then it is used to, the suction is used to draw up the lesion, and then a band is deployed, and a snare caught cautery is used to then resect the lesion. This can actually be repeated multiple times to perform wide field EMR as in this case. And then we get an accurate histology. And in this case, this was a T1A lesion with muscularis mucosa invasion. Additional ways we can detect or improve detection for these important visible lesions include artificial intelligence. A few computer-aided detection systems have been developed. For example, the Argos project yielded this computer-aided detection system, which has recently published one of its benchmarking studies. We can see here that in blue um, dots, we see the performance of 52 general endoscopists in the detection of a test set with specifically subtle sub uh, lesions. The computer, as shown in the red dot, demonstrates a sensitivity of 80 um, percent of 84 percent compared to the overall sensitivity of the general endoscopist which was 63 percent these computer aided detection uh, modalities can identify and help target the endoscopist's eye to better target biopsies and resections another technique that we can use to improve our detection is WATS 3D, or Wide Area Transepithelial Sampling. This is where we take an abrasive brush and brush the lining of the esophageal mucosa, and we're able to collect cells. These are then fixed, and a computer generates a 3D image construct, and then a neural network identifies concerning areas which then are confirmed by a pathologist. A recently published meta-analysis demonstrates that 15% of cases were diagnosed uh, with forcep biopsies for dysplasia, with an additional yield of detection of dysplasia of 7.2% by watts. These cases with discrepancy are also interesting to understand because in those cases where forceps can diagnose dysplasia in 232 cases, watts was negative in, two, in almost two thirds of those cases, suggesting that these modalities best complement each other and WATS does not necessarily replace forcep biopsies. We also are informed by risk of progression to cancer. The annual cancer incidence among patients with high grade dysplasia is six to 12%. The overall rate of low grade dysplasia is quoted to be 0.5 to 0.6% per person per year. And patients without dysplasia have a risk of 0.3% or less per person per year. High-grade dysplasia is the best marker that we have to identify who goes on to develop esophageal cancer and who best benefits from endoscopic therapy. Another marker for progression is P53. Absent or aberrant expression with P53 can show who might be at increased risk for progression to high-grade dysplasia or esophageal adenocarcinoma. A meta-analysis that we performed showed an odds ratio of 3.4 among case control studies and a relative risk of 17 among seven cohort studies. It may be that a panel of biomarkers may provide more information and better risk stratification. 
a commercially available test called Tissue Cipher includes P53 and the following biomarkers as shown here, with a total of 16 features that also includes morphologic assessment. This assay can be used on archival specimens, and a software provides a risk score of one, 0 to 10, which can then be grouped in a risk class of low, intermediate, or high. In a pooled meta-analysis from the Mayo Clinic, a high-risk class by tissue cipher was able to significantly demonstrate prediction of progression compared to clinical variables alone, twice that to what's delivered by expert GI pathology review assessment of, of low-grade dysplasia. And this is both when compared directly as well as in logistic regression models. So sometimes it's tricky to explain all of that to patients. So this is how I explain it to patients. Imagine you are in a train station with multiple trains going to multiple destinations. And one of those destinations is esophageal cancer. Patients who have high-grade dysplasia are on that train going to esophageal cancer. We can't know if the cancer is the next stop or if it is five stops from now, but you're heading in that direction, and we're going to do whatever it takes to get you off that train to keep you from getting esophageal cancer. We are going to cut it, burn it, or freeze it, and accept that there may be some risk associated with these procedures in order to get you off that train. For those patients who have low-grade dysplasia, we need more information to determine if you're high or low risk to go on to develop cancer. It is like you're in a ticket line. You may be getting on that train and it is the right time, but we don't know that you'll actually get on that train. We might need more information by looking at your ticket, by doing another endoscopy, a tissue cipher test, or doing an endoscopic mucosal resection of a lesion before deciding about therapy. If you have no dysplasia, consider that just being present in the train station, but not likely getting on that specific train. We consider your risk of developing cancer as very low. Although we may perform an endoscopy with more rigorous evaluation or an additional test like tissue cipher to be sure you are not getting on that train later. So when we look at these modalities for treatment, we can broadly divide them into tissue acquiring and non-tissue acquiring. And it's important to remember that tissue acquiring allows us not only to remove the lesion, but allows us an accurate histopathologic specimen for diagnosis. And these management strategies are informed by risk. The low risk of progression allows us to survey those with non-dysplastic Barrett's. The high risk of progression or prevalent cancer endorses a treatment strategy for those patients with high-grade dysplasia and low-grade dysplasia allows for endoscopic eradication therapy, but surveillance is also an option. As mentioned, we can further risk stratify these patients, and individual decision-making is important. This is the crux of some of the Barrett's treatment questions, and currently a randomized controlled trial looking at treatment versus surveillance in these low-grade dysplasia patients is currently underway in the United States. And the risk of lymph node metastasis in patients with submucosal carcinoma does support surgery and or systemic therapy. But I will say specifically, there is a subset of patients of low risk submucosal disease that's superficial that may benefit from endoscopic therapy. And this is well characterized by the German experience. Endoscopic eradication therapy is based on the concept of total Barrett's eradication, which not only resects the known neoplasia, but also treats the rest of the at-risk epithelium to treat any metachronous or synchronous lesions. This can be done by complete endoscopic mucosal resection in a piecemeal approach with 96% rate of complete eradication. However, the complications include a 2% perforation rate, as well as a third of patients develop strictures. Radiofrequency ablation allows delivering thermal energy to the esophagus with a variety of different footprints, including a circumferential balloon or focal devices that can be over the scope or through the working channel. And this has excellent eradication on the order of 95%. It's important to appreciate the long-term studies that have come out of this experience, which also suggests that 
Recurrence can occur of intestinal metaplasia in a third of patients, as well as 17% specifically for dysplasia. Endorsing surveillance after endoscopic therapy, after even after eradication of, of uh, disease. Ultimately, a hybrid approach has become the standard approach to take advantage of the benefits of each therapy where visible lesions are removed, we get a diagnosis with the histology, we ablate the rest of the lining, and then ultimately we want to replace the whole lining with neosquamous epithelium. This hybrid approach has excellent success of 93% and a more favorable complication profile compared to complete EMR. We also have some additional ablative strategies, including cryotherapy. And here we can see the cryo spray, which utilizes liquid nitrogen, which freezes the mucosa on contact. And the cells actually die during the thawing process. A meta-analysis of both naive and failed RFA cases demonstrate an eradication of 84% with this technology. We also have a cryo balloon technology, which allows us to deliver the agent, which is nitrous oxide in this case, through a balloon catheter, and we can deliver a freezing therapy, which creates an ice patch. And this can actually be controlled both along the axis of the balloon, as well as rotationally around the axis of the balloon. And multiple studies show this to be as efficacious as RFA. Hybrid APC is another technique that allows the combination of lifting the mucosa off the muscle layer with an agent like methylene blue using a high pressure water jet, and then using APC to ablate the mucosa while protecting the muscle from with a submucosal cushion. A European trial demonstrates complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia on the order of 88%. And finally, I just want to mention ESD, which provides an end block specimen. It's indicated in most cases with squamous cell neoplasia, and it is um, shown that EMR piecemeal is non-inferior to ESD with most cases of Barrett's esophagus with high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal carcinoma. But ESD can be beneficial in those cases where you have concern for submucosal carcinoma, a large or bulky lesion, or a non-lifting lesion. In conclusion, non-endoscopic screening devices may be coupled with biomarkers to capture a broader population to better identify who is at risk for esophageal cancer. Detection and resection of visible lesions is critical to diagnose and treat disease. Risk stratification is helpful to decide who may best benefit from escalation of care, and endoscopic eradication therapy is a standard treatment for Barrett's associated neoplasia. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Vanny. That was a lot of uh, ground to cover and I've got lots of questions. And just to tee up some, it's gonna be around, um, you know, looking at the ACG guidelines and how you're actually practicing. So a lot of good material there. I think uh, um, we're gonna have a lot of good questions at the end. Speaking of which, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and uh, I will uh, ask that question to our uh, panel. Um, as Elisa is uh, spooling things up, a couple of other um, just brief housekeeping events. There is gonna be a survey at the end of this. We would really appreciate your feedback on the, uh, on the content and discussion. So please uh, stick around for that. Um, also, if you're viewing this on a mobile device, uh, please, uh, and you lose your connection, just please reopen the app and go to virtual ed, um, and we'll get you back in. So, um, once again, and thanks to our sponsors, Castle, as well as Medtronic. And without further ado, uh, my partner, Dr. Elisa Ferre. All right. Thank you so much, Trip. Can you guys hear me okay? I might headphones messed up and now I'm concerned about my audio. Can hear you. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I am excited. Thank you, uh, Dr. Conda. That was great um, kind of overview um, of the latest and greatest that is going on with endoscopic, with Barrett's and endoscopic treatments for that. Um, and I have the pleasure of talking to you guys about kind of surgery and its impact on a Barrett's esophagus, uh, as well as a Barrett's esophagus um, associated neoplasia. So 
I kind of have my own objectives that I kind of, that I want to get across to you guys. One of them is understanding when anti-reflux surgery um, is indicated for Barrett's esophagus. I also want to harp on um, understanding the impact anti-reflux surgery has on the progression and outcomes of Barrett's esophagus. And then when esophagectomy is needed um, in patients with early uh, Barrett's esophageal neoplasms or neoplasms. All right. Give me one second. I need to get my face out of there. Okay. So when to consider uh, anti-reflux surgery in Barrett's esophagus. So when I think about patients with Barrett's esophagus, I think that, okay, these patients, Barrett's esophagus is an objective evidence of, of chronic reflux, uh, as Dr. Kanda kind of mentioned. Um, so the first time, or when I consider patients for anti-reflux surgery is when they, it's kind of the same indication that I have for patients normally for anti-reflux surgery. So these are going to be um, patients with persistent troublesome reflux symptoms um, with objective evidence of GERD uh, despite optimized PPI therapy. Um, and, you know, patients with Barrett's esophagus already have objective evidence of GERD. So these are going to be patients that are medically refractory. And so kind of going back one step further is what causes GERD? So um, when we talk about reflux, we talk about uh, dysfunction of the reflux barrier. And this is a uh, picture that was released by AFS um, just describing kind of this anti-reflux barrier. It's composed of three things. One of them is the cruel diaphragm, um, which is both a physiologic and a mechanical barrier. Uh, the other is a gastroesophageal flap valve, uh, which is really created by that angle of hiss um, that you can see here in that middle picture. And then the last is the lower esophageal sphincter, which is um, largely a physiologic um, or functional barrier. So how does re anti-reflux surgery work? Um, so we, uh, I like to think of it as we're fixing the barriers. So uh, usually we're combining two, we're fixing two of these things. So usually the curl diaphragm. So what we're doing is we're combining a hiatal hernia repair curl plasty, where we're actually, you know, fixing a hiatal hernia or tightening that cruise around the esophagus. Uh, and then combining it with either reformation of this gastroesophageal flap valve by recreating this angle of hiss. Um, and we can do that with different types of named fund applications that you see here with the ultimate goal of recreating this valve that you can see on this uh, um, right picture of uh, that we take intra-op uh, endoscopy. And then also you can use endoscopic um, uh, uh, modalities to recreate the valve, uh, such as uh, uh, transoral incisionless fund application or TIF, uh, which is seen here. Again, the whole goal of the fund application is to recreate that flat valve. Um, and then, or we can combine the uh, chiroplasty with uh, the lower esophageal sphincter augmentation or links, um, which you can see here, which really augments that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and so when the reason I bring up uh, reflux in general is that that's kind of the first indication where I think uh, surgery is indicated for patients with Barrett's esophagus. It's going to be, I think of surgery similar to as we use PPIs for symptoms. So patients that have Barrett's esophagus that are symptomatic despite maximum or optimized medical therapy, that are, those are the patients that I'm going to consider initially for anti-reflux surgery. Um, this was a study that kind of looked at quality of life assessment before and after surgery in uh, GERD patients with and without Barrett's esophagus. This specific table is just looking at patients with Barrett's esophagus. So this is quality of life scores before their anti-reflux surgery and then after. Um, just to note, the higher scores reflect a better quality of life. So even uh, after three years after a laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery in patients with Barrett's, there's uh, maintained improvement in their quality of life. So that's first and foremost, just to get that out of the way. And then let's look at the uh, anti-reflux surgery impact on Barrett's esophagus. So there's a lot of talk. I know when I first started uh, learning about Barrett's as a resident and then learning about kind of anti-reflux surgery as a resident, in my mind, it was, okay, do surgery and Barrett's, the risk of cancer should go away. Uh, and it's not entirely the case. So um, I'm going to show you a couple studies kind of looking at long-term outcomes of anti-reflux surgery in patients with Barrett's esophagus, um, especially looking at what happens to their Barrett's esophagus. So this was a retrospective review um, looking at patients with Barrett's who underwent anti-reflux surgery and they had a five-year follow-up. Uh, so the majority of these patients actually had long segment Barrett's. Um, it was 85 patients and they looked at uh, 
pre and post-op quality of life scoring, pre and post-op pH testing, as well as pre and post-op uh, EGD and histology. And what they found was that 90 or 79% of uh, patients had resolution of reflux symptoms. They had normalization of their pH uh, in 81%. And then more importantly though, is looking at their Barrett. So um, uh, low grade dysplasia patients um, ended up uh, getting, uh, becoming complete resolution of their dysplasia in 44 patients or 44% of patients, and then they had complete uh, resolution of intestinal metaplasia or CRIM in 14% of patients. So a significant amount of patients regressed, um, but there was patients that did progress to low-grade dysplasia in 6% of patients. Looking at this, uh, another retrospective review, um, again, with five-year follow-up or greater, um, they were able to show that after anti-reflex surgery, patients with Barrett's esophagus, regression was seen in 31% of patients, but progression, again, occurred in about 8%. So the last study I showed was 6%, now we're at 8%, um, and they were able to show that uh, that patients were seven times more likely to have a failed fund or uh, have a risk of progression with a failed fund application. Um, they also demonstrated that the rate of progression was um, of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus was um, almost 1% um, uh, per patient year. And then this is actually ahead of print that I found it. It was accepted um, uh, just last month. And I thought this was, I mean, the, the numbers are, are massive. Um, but this is looking not at progression of Barrett's to dysplasia, but looking at overall um, esophageal adenocarcinoma progression. Um, and so this was a retrospective review in the Netherlands um, using regist national registries. Um, they were able to identify patients with Barrett's and then they were able to compare those to national cancer registries. Um, and they divided 3,000, almost 34,000 patients um, into anti-reflux surgery arm and anti-reflux medication arm with a, a, a pretty significant follow-up um, up to 32 years, but average was five years for anti-reflux surgery and um, 11 and a half years for um, medication. So what they found was that uh, 14 or 2.5% or of patients in the anti-reflux surgery arm progressed to cancer um, and 1.3% uh, in, um, in the medication arm. Um, they calculated the hazard ratio as 2.2, uh, and this is when they controlled for actually endoscopic therapy um, in patients in the medication arm. Um, and this was actually increased, so the hazard ratio was increased in the uh, anti-reflux surgery group compared to the anti-reflux medication group. Um, I don't think that this means, and they even comment in the paper, um, that it doesn't mean that, you know, the anti-reflux surgery is causing patients to be at higher risk for cancer progression, um, but it does speak to that these the diseases that kind of lend themselves to ending up in a surgeon's office and getting surgery are more severe um, than maybe those that are, are uh, content on their medications, and that was kind of why they thought that maybe there was an increased risk um, in, those, in, in the, that population. But what I want to kind of bestow on you guys is that Overall, there's a bunch of studies, those are just kind of a couple, but anti-reflux surgery does, uh, it has been shown to uh, result in regression um, after long-term follow-up of Barrett's esophagus, but it does not ultimate, ultimately impact um, their overall progression to dysplasia or esophageal adenocarcinoma. I like to tell patients when I'm operating on them that this is an anti-reflux surgery. It is not an anti-cancer anti operation. You must continue surveillance in these patients, um, especially given that uh, you know, up to five to ten percent of patients will progress despite um, you know having control of their uh, having good acid control. Um, so another reason to consider anti-reflux surgery in Barrett's esophagus is to achieve complete resolution of um, intestinal metaplasia uh, after endoscopic eradication therapy. So a couple studies, um, one, this is looking, it was a retrospective review who evaluated patients who achieved CRIM after RFA. So these are patients that had a good response to uh, um, endoscopic eradication therapy. And then they were divided into patients that under what PPIs alone afterwards or patients that went on to get a, a laparoscopic Nissen fund application. There was a two-year follow-up. And the results were that 20% of the patients in the PPI group had a recurrence of their Barrett's esophagus versus 9.1% uh, um, in the laparoscopic Nissen fund application group. 
Overall, when looking at those two groups, that was not significant change, difference in recurrence, but when they broke down into uh, the type of Barrett's, so they looked at patients which they considered long segment Barrett's, which was greater than four centimeters um, circumferential length, that uh, those patients actually did show a significant improvement after laparoscopic um, disinfundiplication uh, in decreasing rates of recurrence uh, after um, uh, of their Barrett's esophagus after endoscopic eradication therapy. So just a, a kind of a, a subpopulation that may benefit. Um, and then this was a multi-institutional retrospective review after, um, again, eradication therapy uh, with laparoscopic nissen application. So 49 patients underwent um, endoscopic eradication therapy and then a nissen application. What they saw was that in 26 uh, and 53 percent of patients that achieved uh, CRIM, um, that not, that they maintained CRIM in 70 percent of those um, patients after laparoscopic nissen application. There was 30 percent recurrence rate of non dysplastic Barrett's after two years. Um, and then in the other population, which they looked at was this complete resolution of dysplasia. So 16% of patients uh, achieved um, the uh, eradication of their dysplasia. And after laparoscopic nissen fund application, they were actually able to achieve fully to CRIM uh, in 62.5% of patients after two years. Um, and one patient uh, ended up progressing um, to low-grade dysplasia, but he initially had high-grade dysplasia. No patients developed uh, high-grade dysplasia or cancer in this population. So what was shown after this is that, you know, although they did look at the after uh, in patients that had achieved CRIM and underwent laparoscopic nissen fund application compared to PPI, there was no difference in durability of the endoscopic therapy, but the special group that may benefit um, in laparoscopic nissen or an anti-reflux surgery after um, uh, endoscopic eradication therapy would be um, in patients that um, uh, had a, uh, had failure to achieve CRIM after dysplasia was eradicated um, or patients that um, uh, had uh, achieved and need to maintain CRIM. So overall, the dur durability in patients with endoscopic eradication therapy after anti-reflux surgery. So for all comers, there really was no change in recurrence rates of Barrett's with anti-reflux surgery versus PPIs um, after CRIM was achieved. There may be an increased dur durability of um, um, of the endoscopic eradication therapy or CRIM in longer segment Barrett's, and it may also be used to achieve CRIM in patients that have already uh, have only achieved resolution of their dysplasia. So those are kind of the two populations that we you may want to consider it. So then it's when to uh, consider esophagectomy for early Barrett's esophagus-associated uh, neoplasia. Um, so as uh, uh, Vanny kind of mentioned, you know, early esophageal cancers kind of consider these high-grade dysplasia, early um, uh, or early esophageal uh, adenocarcinoma is the T1A lesions, which are going to be uh, into the lamina propria or the muscularis mucosa um, versus the T1B lesions that invade into the submucosal layer. Um, and that's what I'm focusing um, the rest of this talk on. So what we know from historic um, uh, data is that historically patients used to undergo uh, esophagectomy for high-grade dysplasia. So using kind of those older um, cohorts, the prevalence of esophageal adenocarcinoma in all comers getting esophagectomy for high-grade dysplasia was almost 40%. Um, I think that that's important that we know that it's 40%, but I don't think that that's, I think that's an overestimation of who would benefit from esophagectomy. I don't think 40% of patients were missing um, because those are for all comers. Those are going to include your T1A lesions and your T1B lesions. So, or, or greater or worse, I guess. Um, so uh, what they did also find was that about 13% were found to have submucosal esophageal adenocarcinoma. And uh, as Dr. Conda explained, that as the these tumors progress into the submucosa, that risk of lymph node metastases uh, is greater. And so those are the patients that we're trying to, to identify of who you know, would benefit from these esophagectomies when the mortality of esophagectomy is greater um, or less than the risk of their um, uh, lymph node metastases, those patients would, would um, benefit. Uh, 
So this is um, a, a review of a national cancer database. Um, and it's looking at all patients that had early esophageal adenocarcinoma that had a primary esophagectomy and at least 15 lymph nodes harvested. And then they just looked back at those specimens and saw what were the independent predictors of lymph node metastases. So what they found was uh, that submucosal invasion, as we've talked about why that's important um, for lymph node metastases, uh, the lymphovascular invasion was associated with uh, increased risk, decreased differentiation, so those patients with poor differentiated uh, tumors, and then tumor size greater or equal to um, two centimeters. Uh, and so what they further went on to talk about was this T1A uh, high-risk patient versus a T1B low-risk patient. So a T1A patient um, with poor differentiation actually had a lymph node metastasis rate in this study of 6.7%. So in overall 90-day mortality after esophagectomy in this uh, uh, group of patients was 3.1%. So if you look at that, their lymph node metastases rate was higher than their mortality rate. So in even a T1A patient with some of these risk factors, they may actually benefit from um, an esophagectomy depending on uh, you know, a, co a, a, a slew of factors. Um, similarly, a large T1A lesion greater than two centimeters had carried a lymph node metastases rate of about 10.2%. Um, and then conversely, T1B lesions, which uh, as Dr. Kondak kind of had mentioned, um, you know, there are a special subset that we may not need an esophagectomy in. Um, this might be useful information to kind of help stratify that. But um, so a T1B lesion that's well differentiated and less than two centimeters, the lymph node metastases rate was 4.2%. The overall 90-day mortality was 6%. So that lymph node metastases rate was lower than the 90-day mortality rate. Um, uh, so potentially uh, avoiding esophagectomy in that patient may uh, be useful. Um, and then this is speaking more to those superficial T1B um, lesions. So this was a review of 123 patients with either suspicious on EUS or definitive um, after uh, endoscopic or surgical resection of uh, the SM1 or those very superficial um, T1B esophageal adenocarcinomas. And what they did was they uh, analyzed these patients separately for what they considered low risk lesions, which were low grade or um, you know the well and poorly differentiated were low risk, no lymphovascular invasion and no vascular invasion. And then high risk patients were characterized as poorly differentiated with lymph, uh, lymphovascular invasion and vascular invasion. Um, and then they divided those uh, the group into either low risk or high risk. And what they found was that low risk patients uh, um, had a 2% risk of lymph node metastases and 9% in the high-risk group. Uh, mortality overall in esophagectomies in this, in, uh, uh, in this group was 3%. Uh, and what they found was that lymph node metastases and T1B, um, superficial T1B lesions with a low risk pattern was the lymph node metastases rate was lower than the mortality rate. And in those patients, again, as I had kind of spoke to that last um, study, those patients could potentially avoid esophagectomy and, and just get endoscopic resection. Um, and then sort of looking at the other side is what do you do not with a lesion that you know and you can kind of characterize um, uh, is what do you do with these failed endoscopic uh, uh, eradication therapies. I know Dr. Kanda mentioned the cryotherapy as an, uh, an option, um, but this group uh, reviewed all patients that underwent esophagectomy for failed endoscopic therapy um, in patients with high grade dysplasia or intramucosal uh, carcinoma. It was a small group, so only 15 patients. Um, and prior to esophagectomy, there was a, they had about four sessions of endotherapy um, and they were referred to esophagectomy for either progression of disease, failure to clear disease, or recurrent disease. Um, and what was found is that um, about 20, uh, well, 20% of patients had T1B lesions, 7% had a T2 lesion, so these would be more aggressive uh, cancers, um, and 20% uh, had lymph node metastases. All of those were in patients with T1B or higher. Um, although none of this reached um, statistical significance, I think it, it's an important study to note because all the patients that ended up progressing did have a more advanced pathology on index endoscopy. So they had the intramucosal cancer um, and they had more um, prior endoscopic eradication therapy sessions. So uh, which 
in the group that ended up having lymph node metastases had uh, a median of uh, 6.5 sessions versus three. So there is um, a lot of talk that patients with, have had failed um, eradication of their dysplasia after three se sessions should be potentially considered um, um, failure of therapy and sent to a, a surgeon for a possible esophagectomy. Um, and so this is actually a, a, a review article um, uh, by Dr. Kanda. She's uh, one of the authors on it. Um, but there was a nice table in here. I didn't include every single thing um, from that, but basically characteristics of high-grade dysplasia lesions that are associated with um, esophageal adenocarcinoma, submucosal invasion, and lymph node metastases, because that's ultimately, I think, what we're trying to capture is those patients that have the potential and have metastasized to the lymph nodes. Um, and so some of those risk factors are long segment, um, multifocal dysplastic barrets. So in you know a long segment of barrets, you have multi uh, many areas that show uh, dysplasia, that there's ulceration, um, kind of discussed in the last couple studies, lesions greater than two centimeters, poorly differentiated tumors, um, lymphovascular invasion, and then that failure to achieve uh, eradication of dysplasia after three treatments. Um, so these are patients that, you know, if if you run across these potentially referring to a, a surgeon would be a good idea. So this for the now kind of going into the meat of uh, types of esophagectomy, I'll kind of be brief on this, but there's three types. Um, the transhiatal, which is an abdominal and cervical incision, the Ivor Lewis, which is a chest and abdominal incision, and then the three field, which combines all three cavities, um, known as the uh, also known as the McEwen. Um, there's different options for conduits. Um, the gastric conduit's the most uh, favored just because it has one anastomosis um, versus the colon interposition and the jejunal interposition uh, have, you tend to have three anastomoses. Um, and Nowadays, these are being done both minimally invasive and open. There's a definitely a, a higher um, a push toward minimally invasive. Um, and this was a net meta-analysis of examining both. Um, so met the minimally invasive versus open esophagectomy. Uh, minimally invasive esophagectomy had a hor shorter uh, length of stay, reduced total complications, including pulmonary and cardiovascular, uh, and lower in hospital mortality. Um, it did have an increased OR time, and there was no difference in the number of lymph nodes resected, GI complications, and in the stomatic leak. So there are some favorable outcomes with um, newer um, uh, techniques. Um, again, this was another group uh, in Pittsburgh uh, who looked at over 1,000 patients, and their operative mortality after minimally invasive esophagectomy, either McEwen or Ivor Lewis, was 1.3. Um, they had no difference in an asthmatic leak or uh, length of stay, uh, both ICU and um, overall, um, but the uh, there was less recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries or palsy in the Ivor Lewis group, just avoiding that cervical neck incision. Um, so overall, the steps of a, what we do in, uh, in Austin is a minimally invasive McEwen. Um, so you do a thoracoscopic mobilization um, with a lymphadenectomy, gastric mobilization and conduit creation. And then you make an incision in the neck and create your esophagogastric anastomosis. Um, we treat the pylorus. Typically, we're using Botox, and then we place a jejunal feeding tube. Um, and so this is a quick video, hopefully it goes quick, um, of us doing that. So we open the inferior pulmonary ligament, and then here we are taking down the azagous vein. Um, admittedly, this is not my best operate, or not my best operate, my best uh, video. I made it last night, so forgive me. Um, I'll try to kind of run through it. Um, so this is us, so I'm going to go through this a little bit faster. This is us taking down that azagous vein, sorry, here. So there's us stapling it off. I'm trying to run through this quicker. Um, and then we're taking the lymph node packets. Um, you're going to try to get the parasophageal lymph nodes. And then there's a host of other lymph node packets that you want to get kind of paratracheal um, and cervical. And then as you we move down, this is going to be, you can see our diaphragm here at the bottom. Um, and then at the end of completion of our dissection, we're actually just in, putting in a chest tube and then placing the patient prone. Um, uh, it's not letting me go to the next slide. There it goes. Um, so as we place the patient prone, once we complete our thoracic uh, mobilization, um, a team goes to the neck to start the cervical dissection while the other team is doing the laparoscopic mobilization. 
And again, I'll kind of zoom through this. I know we're getting close on time. So here we are identifying our right gastropoploic and we are avoiding injuring that, um, mobilizing the greater curve and the lesser curve. Um, and then here we are opening up our, uh, our mediastinum into our prior dissected uh, mediastinum from our thoracic mobilization. And I'm gonna run through that. So here is our mobilization into the kind of end of the mediastinum. And then here we are taking our left gastric artery. And then at the completion, we check and make sure we have enough length by taking the pylorus and making sure it reaches the hiatus. We actually transect in the neck and pull it down um, and re remove our specimen through the abdomen. So we do a little bit of a hybrid approach because I like to do an open um, J tube. Um, and then here we are externalizing our specimen and checking the perfusion prior to doing um, our, uh, our cervical anastomosis. Um, so I kind of want to end on just volume matters. So this was a pooled uh, analysis of uh, nine um, relevant publications with uh, about 28,000 patients. Um, and it's looking at volume between high and low um, volume centers. So there was an increase in incidence of in-hospital and 30-day mortality that was significant between those that do a lot of these operations versus those that do not. The thresholds um, are listed in that table. Um, they were not standardized of what is a low uh, volume center and what is a high volume center. Um, so kind of to summarize, I just, um, you know, there's many reasons why uh, anti-reflux surgery and esophagectomy are needed or are beneficial in patients with um, Barrett's esophagus, obviously, uh, just to treat GERD symptoms. Um, another is to help with eradication, um, both of uh, to maintain CRIM and to uh, in long segment Barrett's and to uh, maintain uh, eradication of dysplasia. And then esophagectomy should be used in patients that have a higher risk of, uh, if their lymph node metastasis risk is higher than the operative mortality, that's when your benefit's going to outweigh the risk of the operation. Um, and uh, volume matters. So I am, want to thank our uh, program sponsors again, uh, Medtronic and Castle Biosciences. Um, and I think we're going to open up to any questions. Yeah. So thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Vanny. Um, as a guy, many people know this, but not everybody, that I have a Barrett's esophagus myself. I've also undergone anti-reflux pr procedures. Um, my last surgeon was, in fact, Dr. Ferre. Um, my uh, Barrett's shrunk uh, to um, short segment, but I think it's important what you said, Elisa, that this is not an anti-Barrett's operation. We're still operating for quality of life. We may gain some um, benefit there, but um, I think we still need to maintain those surgical principles. I'm struck as both of y'all talked about um, how, you know, whether it's looking at Barrett's progression, even after surgery, and then also patients uh, who might need multiple endoscopic therapies, that it's really the biology of the patient um, that's driving this. So we can't really categorize people, you know, um, just yet, but we're getting there. So Vanny and Elisa, how are you using um, these novel technologies in your practice today? So, you know, someone's coming in, how are you looking at um, the different technologies and, and how are you going to apply them? Because I feel like, and I'll just editorialize here, that the the guidelines from the ACG on Barrett's are kind of all over the place, or they're not really all over the place, but it's, you know, expert opinion, low, you know, level, low level of evidence. So we're all out there struggling, you know, how to apply new technologies here because Barrett's is a big deal, as you mentioned, Vanny, and, and we've got to really make a bigger impact on these uh, patients uh, and the disease in general. Yeah, so um, for me, um, for example, that patient with low-grade dysplasia, um, I really um, utilize a, a low threshold for endoscopic mucosal resection. Um, so I do um, actually consent them every single time for that initial visit and um, perform EMR um, when I uh, see any mucosal irregularity. And that's probably my um, something that I feel strongly about. In addition to that, I also um, utilize a variety of tools, whether it be narrowband imaging, but I also consider uh, sending the tissue, for example, like uh, for tissue cipher, that might be something that allows me in a confirmed low-grade patient who's on the fence 
um, to go ahead and, um, you know, counsel them that they might have a higher risk of progression if they're in a high risk class versus reassure them that if they really want to avoid uh, therapy if possible, and they're in a low risk class, then give them that reassurance. I think the individual decision making is important. Um, I also will, you know, utilize something like uh, watch 3D in a long segment of Barrett's um, without a presence of dysplasia. And if I see anything concerning, I might bring that patient back um, and then do a more, you know, do a, a careful examination. And again, um, I, quick to co consent them for EMR. I don't think that some of these new technologies are the gateway to automatically do endoscopic resection and endoscopic ablation on everyone because of that risk of prevalent disease. And so I always feel like my first job is to make sure they don't have cancer and then appropriately risk stratify them and make an individual decision making um, path for them, um, you know, whatever, wherever they're at. Yeah, it seems like we talk about personalized medicine a lot, and we're we're headed in that direction. Um, Elisa, how do you use Watts and uh, Tissue Cipher and all these other adjuncts in your practice? Yeah, so um, I I agree with uh, Vanny when talking about you know individualizing these patients. Like everybody's risk, their baseline risk factors for esophageal cancer are different, um, and their biology of their Barrett's is different. So um, in any parent, patient that has Barrett's esophagus, usually I won't do it on just visible lesions. I'll confirm with a uh, cold force up in Seattle protocol before I'll use Watts on my surveillance, but I will use Watts usually during all of my um, Barrett's esophagus surveillance. Um, in patients that um, we are doing surveillance, um, I will send for tissue cipher um, and any non-dysplastic um, Barrett's. Um, I have started and it's kind of if their insurance will cover it and if patients will um, uh, are okay with the risk and depending on, again, their risk factors, um, even try to get them ablation for high risk uh, lesions that are long segment Barrett's. Um, uh, although, you know, that kind of is still the, the question's still out there whether or not that's kind of the right move. Um, but if they have enough risk factors for a progression to esophageal cancer with the tissue cipher and the P53 um, being high, I, I will um, counsel them on potentially getting ablated early. Great. Um, we had a question, uh, and please uh, put your questions um, in the Q&A, and there's a couple coming in. But the first question from the Q&A was, is there any advantage of TIF uh, one versus TIF two in Barrett's uh, um, regression? Um, again, I there and cancer prevention. So again, this is the, none of the anti-reflux procedures that we do. I would agree with Dr. Frey completely that these are not cancer prevention operations. Um, we know that Barrett's comes from reflux. We can stop reflux, but I think that's when, you know, understanding the biology as we're going to be able to do uh, now a little bit and, and certainly greater in future years. Um, but we are not performing anti-cancer operations. Um, we do have a good uh, prospective randomized trial comparing a TIF2 or a combination uh, um, laparoscopic uh, parasophageal hernia repair um, along with TIF to Nissen. Um, those data are being accrued now um, in centers like ours. And uh, so we'll have some information there, but Barrett's is not being studied. So we won't have that information. Um, so I think it's really important to not, you know, I think anti-reflux surgery has an important role, but it, but claiming that it's a cancer prevention or Barrett's reduction uh, operation is not the way we should go. We should be doing lifestyle um, and quality of life operations. Um, okay, there's another question here. A question for Vanny. If a patient with tissue cipher high risk, or I guess it's a, they have high risk um, and, and or indeterminate risk, but biopsy only shows non-dysplastic Barrett's, when do you bring them back for uh, repeat endoscopy? Um, so uh, I will uh, talk to them. It makes a difference if it's a long segment versus a short segment. It also makes a difference whether or not I look at the initial endoscopy protocol and um, whether if it was another person other than myself, whether did they do all the things that I expect, R report the landmarks, report um, the length using a prog criteria, did they um, see any visible lesions and how did they report it? 
Um, the more detail that's in that report and the more, or if I've done it and I did a careful examination, I, I am happy to give a little bit um, longer interval versus if um, there's really nothing um, in there that suggests that a careful inspection for visible lesions was done. So um, on average, probably I offer them six to 12 months, depending on how careful that initial exam was. But if that initial exam was not to my reassurance, um, I'll say six months or sooner if, if there's any concern. Fair enough. Sounds like you're pretty aggressive. Yeah, go ahead, Elisa. Um, so I actually have a question on that. So um, at our institution, we were trying to kind of create with all of these adjuncts uh, um, different protocols for different types of patients, you know, obviously short segment, long segment, high risk on tissue cipher, not, you know, um, have you, do you have a kind of like algorithm that you follow um, with surveillance? Like, do you ever like in which patients are you really going to wait the three to five years versus saying, okay, you know, you, you had mentioned six months with a high risk, even though it's still non-dysplastic without any visible lesions or, you know, what, what, what is your, your surveillance interval, um, in kind of these patients that, especially in patients with, when you get a tissue cipher result, that says high risk. Right. So for a tissue cipher result, that's high risk. I really want to bring them back, um, uh, consent them for EMR, perform EMR of any visible lesions, and then make sure there's nothing there. And then I'll lengthen out the surveillance interval. Uh, longer segments, um, I will err on the side of two years um, to three years once there's confirmation of no cancer. Um, and then um, in patients, though, that are uh, low risk, short segment, no evidence of dysplasia, I am counseling them that they're okay to wait five years. And some patients are a little bit hesitant and something like a low risk tissue cipher score allows that lengthening of interval um, a little bit more securely, um, if they, especially if they've always been used to getting it every three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that that's great. I would love to see kind of more of that in our risk stratification of how, surveillance timing. Um, just three to five years is such a, it's such a long time, especially if you have a long you know, long lesion. Um, and I just think that some of the guidelines or, or uh, society guidelines don't really reflect yet. Hopefully in the future, we'll see more of that technology involved in surveillance timing. Yeah, we are now looking at segment length a little bit more to be able to say uh, for shorter segments, go the five years and longer segments, bring them back in three years. And the British society will uh, guidelines even suggest for long segments to go every two to three years. Yeah, I think that this is a great opportunity for AFS um, to create some evidence-based algorithms utilizing the new technologies that might take a little bit of little bit of time to get into the actual guidelines um, because they're guidelines for guidelines and, and things can um, get a little tough there. Um, final question for you, Dr. Ferre, um, before we wrap up. Vanny mentioned that, you know, she's got to have confidence in that index endoscopy. Um, we see lots of endoscopy reports and uh, things. What, in your view, um, if you're thinking about, if you're doing that index endoscopy, what equals a great index endoscopy? What are the components that you're looking for? Yeah, well, I think Dr. Khan had a great slide on that. Um, but I mean, I it's the more detail about number one, the Barrett's lesions, whether they're looking at the landmarks and actually naming them, whether they're using the proper classification terminology tells me that they know what they're talking about in the endoscopy. Um, uh, and, you know, I think it's- So you mean Prague, we've got to- we, Using- We've got to, yeah. we've got to move, people have to describe Barrett's and the Prague classification. Yeah, utilizing meaningful language in there that communicates what they're seeing um, um, is really important to me. And if I don't see that kind of like uh, Dr. Kondo was mentioning, you know, I, I likely will repeat myself. Um, Great. Well, um, I want to say thank you to everyone joining. Um, this has been really great and educational for me. Um, really appreciate everybody's time. Um, um, and we'll be able to, you'll be able to replay this webinar and it'll be available on Endoscopy Now, uh, especially the Endoscopy Now app within a few days, um, and also on the uh, AFS American Forget Society website. So thanks again. Really appreciate your time.
And thank you to uh, Dr. Conda and uh, Dr. Perret. All right, thanks, Trish. Thank you.